In 1997, two remarkable women I admired the most passed away uh, the same week. Lady Diana, who passed on August 31st, and Mother Teresa, September 5th. I remember it was a shocking moment. If you lived in the 80s and the 90s, these two women were the living embodiment of what charity and generosity means. But whenever I looked at them, I also saw a stark um, difference between the way they smile. If you can put up that uh, picture one more time. You look at the way these two women smile. They both smile a lot. When Lady Diana smiles, it is almost like contrived for camera. Uh, because you can always see an underlying stress behind her smile. But she had to, she had to do it. Uh, and it is painful. I mean, she is handling a lot of stress, as you all knew. Now, Mother Teresa is no exception. You think Mother Teresa had a nice life? She was actually managing a multi-million dollar corporation. Do you believe it or not? She also had her stress. But she could smile without a prompt. And her smile was spontaneous and almost contagious. Uh, you know, the, the, the joy that radiated out of her face was almost palpable if you are around Mother Teresa. I wonder, what, what was the difference between these women? Both I admired almost equally. See, then I realized that there's a difference between the expressions of generosity these two women represent. Lady Diana gave. She gave a lot. Actually, as of 2012, the memorial fund in Diana's name alone has given around $145 million on charity, just on her memorial fund. It's not her money or memorial fund. So that's the kind of giving this lady has done. That's the kind of generosity that came out of her. Yet, she maintained a royal lifestyle. She had uh, palaces and she had yachts, and she had high-profile relationships, and she had everything she had, but she gave from what she had. Now, Mother Teresa, on the other hand, she was not just giving what she had, she was giving up what she had. There's a big difference. Mother Teresa, at the end of her life, do you know what she had? What was her possession? was an extra set of clothes and an umbrella. That's all she had in her name. That's all the ladies of missionaries of charity are allowed to have, that's all she had. Personal possession was an extra set of clothes and an umbrella. Everything else was given up. So there is a difference between give, giving what we have and, there is a dif and, and giving up what we have. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word today? I'm going to read two verses. The first one is familiar. This is called the golden verse of the Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now the next one is also John 3.16, but it is 1 John 3.16. I don't know how many of you are aware, John has written a gospel, then he went on to write three more letters. So first letter, second letter, and third letter. So 1 John 3.16 goes this way. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated.
For God so loved the world that he gave. I want to hear that one more time because we are so quick to go to the second part of that, that part. But it says, God so loved the world that he gave. See, giving is the most visible, tangible expression of loving. When I grew up as a little kid, I always wondered that my father never said the word, I love you, to me. My father never said, I love you. There are a lot of uncles did, aunts did, friends did, neighbors did. Even some of you still do. You know, you say, Pastor Matthew, we love you. You know, I hear that all the time. Sometimes I wonder, everybody who said, I love you to me, put a nickel in a, <laughs> in, a, in a can, I would have been a millionaire by now. But I never doubted the love of my father because this man kept giving. He gave me food, he gave me clothes, he gave me shelter, he gave me tuition fee, he gave me everything I had, I ever wanted and ever needed. So I did not have to do a DNA test to figure out whether he is my father. Because his expression of giving was in of itself the best proof there is of his loving. Does that make sense? So that's why I said giving is the best expression of loving. Now there is a difference between this, this word, you know, the, um, you know, it is such a difficult topic to talk about. I'm not talking about giving. I'm talking about generosity. You know, every year, every pastor is asked to preach on giving, mostly closer to the end of the financial year. You know, it is like going to the dentist, right? You know you have to go, but you hate going there. Believe me, no pastor likes to go and ask for money, but it is the dereliction of duty as the CEO of a big corporate organization to talk about the realities of life. So I am not doing that. That's why I chose right now. We have no financial problem right now. We are in a good place, and we are, I'm not trying to raise any budget. We are, we are not even close to the, the budget year yet, but the pro, the what I wanted to talk, talk to you about is generosity, and this is not a sermon. Our sermon series starts next week. But I want you to get some foundation clear. See, in, in generally in all religions, world religions talk about giving as a moral imperative, right? When you go to Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, they talk about giving, and we, the, use, the word they use is dana, dana. Dana is a word which represents charity, right? You give to each other and give to a cause and give to charitable cause and give to God and the temples and what, whatever that is. That is integral to Eastern religions. And the same way, when you come to Islam, Islam has five pillars of their religion. These are five pillars which is foundational core doctrines of this religion and one of these foundational pillars of Islam is called zakat. Zakat is giving, you know, the charitable giving. But thankfully their percentage is much lower. All you need to do is give 2.5 percent. Zakat, that's all it is, right? Now, <laughs> now when you come to Judaism and you probably heard the word shadaka which is again giving in the Jew, Jewish uh, religion, depending on the cultural background where you are from, uh, it can go anywhere from 10% to 20%. And now these are all giving. These are all generosity as an expression in so many ways to show that you are a good human being and you live uh, as you represent this religion well. And in some cases, especially in Eastern religion, it is also a way of building up what we call good karma. You know, the, the Eastern, Eastern religions work on the principle of gar, karma, which is essentially brownie points. You make enough brownie points so that when you go to the next 
next life you get an upgrade. You know, that's the idea of karma. And in some way, Christians or, you know, the people of Abrahamic religions also somehow think that by giving to God and giving to people, we somehow earn some credits when we go to the next life. But what we read today gives us a very different perspective because the, John 3.16 told us what happened on that old rugged cross. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave. Then, 1 John 3.16 takes John 3.16 and laid it flat. John 3.16 about this. 3.16 is about this. God gave, vertical. And 1 John 3.16 is horizontal. Because God gave... Because God gave, we also have to give our life for our brethren and sister and two, right? Like, you know, so, so it's the vertical expression of God's love is what inspires us to do the horizontal expression of generosity. Now, that is a big difference. When we give, we are not doing out, out of a moral imperative. This is something we are commanded to do. No, what we are actually doing is not giving. We are not even being generous. We are actually modeling what Christ did. Our giving is the modeling of what Christ did. Now here is a problem though. What God did was out of his nature. Giving was part of his nature. That's why God so loved the world that he gave. What is the most important nature or attribute of God? What is the first thing you hear about God everywhere, even in popular culture? They say God is love, right? So God is love, that is, the founda that is foundational to his nature. So he was giving out of his nature. The world religion teaches us to give out of human nature. Human nature has a sense of altruism. We, get, we feel good when we help other people, whether you believe in God or not. You don't have to believe in God to give. Actually, people who don't believe in God give more than many religious people because it is in human nature to be altruistic. But when you give out of God's nature, there is a problem because God so loved the world that he gave. Here is the problem. Because love is in God's nature, God cannot not love. Does that make sense? Because it, it is not that God is loving, God is love. So that's why he kept on giving, he kept on giving on the cross until he lost everything. This is the self-emptying love of God. You know, in Philippians, we read that beautiful verse. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself. Because God is love, and because love is the found foundation to his nature, he couldn't not give and so, so not, not love in the same way God cannot not give. So God was not just giving us something, God was giving up something for us. God was giving up his own life for us. Now that is the problem when we give out of God's nature. See, this is the difference between generosity and radical generosity. Generosity is what Lady Diana did. You give something. You give to people. Good for you. You should do that. But radical generosity is giving up what you have for the cause of the kingdom. Because we are not giving out of human nature. We are giving out of divine nature. Now that's why when people ask me, so what is this tithe? And you know, the Christians give 10% of everything. And you know, sometimes people ask very intricate questions. So should I give 10% of, uh, of, of what I have before taxes or after taxes? Should I give it, you know, gross? So this is when we become religious, right? And you, as you know, the Bible doesn't talk about, the New Testament doesn't necessarily talk about the tithing at all. Because if you ask me for a percentage, the percentage is 100%. If you are modeling Christ, 
What he did was the self-emptying love of God. That radical generosity is 100%, right? So I'm not going to talk about tithing. I'm not going to talk about giving in any of the series. So to make it easy, I hope you, all, you got this little guide or, or flyer, whatever you call it. This, you know, the ushers might have given it with you, given when you came to the sanctuary today. And this will answer some of these questions because I'm, I'm not particularly fond of talking about this topic, right? Now, that is one thing. And the second thing is that I did a sermon on what giving is. Why should Christians give or something like that? That was the title of the sermon. I remember the date was August 6, 2023. So I encourage you to go to YouTube and we have a YouTube page and there, there's a sermon called, Why Should We Give to God? Yes, that was the title, August 6th. So that I don't want to repeat everything what I said before again. And I want you to memorize everything which is written. It's very simple. Okay? And it's very simple. It's not really asking you for money too. But it's actually giving you some biblical teaching so that I, I, I can avoid, avoid talking to this every time. So I want all of you to have it and I want you to take it home. I want you to keep it and, and I want you to consider whenever you even uh, contemplate giving to God. Now, radical generosity. When you walk around the campus today, uh, you will see all our posters have changed. You know, you have little posters around, and you will see three things in the poster. So this is the, and if, when you look at the bulletin, uh, this, this uh, flyer I gave you, it has three expressions of this radical generosity. At least I want you to memorize that three. So these are the three things. Love as Christ loved us. Give with a cheerful heart. Serve with a generous spirit. So that is the definition, working definition of radical generosity. Love as Christ loved us. Give with a cheerful heart and serve with a generous spirit. Okay? So I want you to memorize that. This is what we will be talking about in the next three months. It is not just about giving financially. It is also serving in the community. As you have already seen, we have missional communities going out in our neighborhood. And I'm so proud of being a pastor of this church, which is already practicing radical generosity in so many different ways. And I'm just so excited. This is a great season to be uh, a minister to this church. And I'm, I'm, I'm trekking along with you what the Holy Spirit is doing in our congregation. But again, Radical generosity is also about hospitality, inviting people over for dinner. If you are a Republican, invite a Democrat to, for a dinner, or a Democrat, invite a Republican. And if you are neither, neither of this, invite a Canadian for dinner, whatever the, you, you do. So that, you know, people who don't necessarily subscribe to your worldview, being generous to, uh, being hospitable to their ideas, and, 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 and in that conversation, that's another way of expressing radical generosity. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go go along in the next three months. One more thing, I want you to remember two dates, two dates, okay? Mark it in your uh, uh, calendar. April 27th, April 27th, we are going to do a seminar on servant leadership. That's a Saturday. It comes with a free breakfast. I'll give you more information uh, next week. It's servant leadership is all about how do you serve it's not just in church and it's not just in a, uh, in a charitable organization, but, but wherever you are, how you serve as Christ served, in a way, right? So, so that will be an amazing seminar. We will all be there, and our leadership development team is, also, uh, is all coordinating it as a way to identify the next generation leaders in our church. So you are all invited. April 27, Saturday. Another date is June 22nd. That's another Saturday. Again, a breakfast um, seminar on... Uh, navigating or, uh, or using your finances in God's way. This is a seminar on financial stewardship. Jeff Ryan, who is, a, uh, who's a, who is up in the top of the financial sector in Hong Kong, and some of you know him uh, for a major bank, he will be doing this presentation. So people who are experts in this area, June 22nd, that's on financial stewardship. This is all going to be part of this series, okay? Now, as we approach the com approach communion and I want you to internalize what, what I just spoke to you today we are not here to 
be charitable. We are not here doing humanitarian causes. We are doing something much more than that. We are commanded to do much more than that. It's funny, you know, now after the Easter, this is the first Sunday after Easter, many of you are relieved and some of you are on Lenten fasting, some of you are fasting, some of you gave up meat, and some of you became vegetarian for 40 days of Lent. I was talking to a family, they said they gave up sweets. They were not having sweets for 40 days. Uh, and I said, why? Why don't you have sweets? And they said, well, one of the senior pastors of Lake Avenue said to them, <laughs> that Jesus gave his life for us, we should give, give up our sweets for him. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm not going to reveal who the pastor is. I said, hmm, <laughs> if I am Jesus, what would I feel? <laughs> I gave up my life for you. <laughs> I will give up our sweets for you, right? <laughs> so the new senior pastor is asking you not only to give up your sweets or meat, and I'm here to ask you for your food, and I'm going to ask you for your clothes, I'm going to ask you for your cars, and I'm going to ask you for your, 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 your beautiful mansions, and I'm going to ask you to give up even your life, because without giving up your life, you will never receive it. That's what Jesus said. So, radical generosity, we should be expression of radical generosity of giving up what we have for the cause of the kingdom, and that's how we earn it back. Now, as we approach the table, remember, this is the most beautiful, grandeur expression of radical generosity. So, I'm going to read a scripture. Romans chapter... Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the, for a, for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, while we were not worthy, while we were not lovable, Christ still loved us. Now that is what this table represents. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward uh, for serving communion. As they take their places, I'm giving you the instructions which already, you already know. Exit to the left and come forward. Receive the communion re-enter through the right side. And anybody who cannot move from your seat, would you please raise your hand right now so that our ushers can take a note so that we can get the communion to you. Anybody who cannot uh, move from your seat. Okay, I believe the ushers are seeing you. Uh, so so you, you will receive communion where you are. And gluten-free tables are on this side. If you have any allergy issues, you can receive a communion from there too. Now come forward to rededicating yourself to love others as Christ loved us and being the living embodiment of radical generosity, what this table represents. God bless you as you come.